in the USDA Forest Service and holds degrees in both forestry and education. He has over 40 years experience in educating and engaging diverse audiences in natural history, forestry, and anthropology. And if you don't find him on the trail, he's substitute teaching or volunteering in our community. Thank you very much. Yes. to pick up a couple of sticks and um, feel free to play with them and see what you can come up with. I will let you, um, I'm going to be using some of those for the presentation and uh, perhaps you can, you'll be able to tell me what I might be able to use. This is perfect, uh, what she's doing. Mm. <laughs> if you taste it, you might be able to get an idea of what, of what that is if you don't know already, and what what might uh, we use it for. Um, I started um, quite a few years ago. I, I started actually doing some of this as a kid because my mom would say, um, Look, we don't have any uh, powdered cinnamon, so she brought the bark, and she'd throw the bark in here, and look, I had to, and she'd say, grind it. Come on, Mom, you're kidding. <laughs> yeah, passing down a culture, we sometimes resist. We're not going to believe that we would be able to make a powder out of, a, out of the bark. But sure enough, after a few tries, we were in the, ah, not fine enough, do it some more. Not fine enough, do it some more. So we kept on um, doing that. So some of that, I believe it's from my background. A lot of the influence of my parents. My mother taught me a lot about uh, medicinal plants and how uh, they're used. And my dad um, was in a couple of uh, wars in, in Mexico. So he, he taught me some things about some survival and uh, medicine out in the field as well. So I'm uh, I'm about 50% Mesoamerican, and the other 50% is Iberian, over in Spain, in Portugal, in that area. 9% North African, it was the Moors coming across a few thousand years ago. Okay. Um, and um, a lot, I, the influence I believe, as well as my parents, is when we were working in the fields, I was a little kid, we picked cotton, picked oranges, nectarines. So we were outside a lot. We were out, and to me, the, the ditches that were dry and earth lined ditches were, to me, they were the Grand Canyon. Hey, you went to the Grand Canyon, went to Yosemite. Uh, the only waterfalls we saw were the, the water coming out of the, the, uh, the canals. Oh, those are cool waterfalls. Um, when I went uh, to see the college counselor, the college counselor asked, what, uh, what do you enjoy doing, what do you do? So while I spend a lot of time outdoors, and the counselor, hey, we have a great forestry program. So, okay. so I leaned over to this forestry and back outside, fighting fire, fire prevention, and timber management. Um, so I enjoy doing that. So I retired from that. And at each point, uh, even early on, right after college, uh, I would go back to some form of education and, and teaching. I was a sixth grader at, at, at an outdoor ed school, and I really enjoyed that. So I went back as a high school counselor at our local outdoor ed school, and then as college counselor. Uh, so I was in between fire season and in the winter time, so why don't I go teach? So I went to outdoor ed school and started teaching. And so I've been back and forth, back and, forth learning a lot. and uh, I do some archaeology, I started uh, archaeology as well. Um, I'm an archaeology tech. And uh, 
that helps with some of the uh, aspects of, of uh, plant mapping uh, help us as archaeologists uh, survey doing some survey around artwork and drawings. And I forgot to tell you, please ask questions. <laughs> I've been talking three or four minutes already. Any questions so far? Yes, John. Where were you picking cotton? Where were those fields? Oh, Tulare County. Tulare County. Yeah. So I'm wow. proud to say that at my age, the little kid, the little one, I was able to pick up five cents a pound, maybe or three cents a pound. Back then, it was it fun? Probably not. <laughs> but now, I uh, really appreciate the yeah. Yep, Tulare Tulare County. Anything else? So, um, what I would like to do is demonstrate how an arrow uh, is made, and it's it's a I say North American uh, because I do have some some North American influence. California, and I also uh, work with uh, in the Navajo land, and I also work. Uh, in uh, Pueblo, when we're doing some petroglyphs. So I try to incorporate the West. I was talking to, I'm sorry, your name? Chris. Chris? If you don't mind me saying, she's from, she came from Tennessee. And I don't know much about the East. Uh, but there's a lot of history everywhere. We got uh, points and rocks. Rocks are everywhere. Uh, so on this side, I have rocks. And then in the center is our animal parts, and then the plants, so the rocks, animals, and plants. And I do a lot of work with the kids, the students, the RAP, RAP, try to keep. And then it helps me also organize and build from here today. Um, in the rocks, animals, and plants, and so that's why I like, kind of lean towards the west. It, it doesn't matter where you go, if you get to Hawaii or Sumatra, they're finding um, artifacts. Anywhere you have a, a volcano, anywhere you have volcanic activity, you're gonna have igneous uh, rocks, igneous geology, and then that's what, uh, students are, uh, is one of the important aspects uh, and characteristics of the rocks that we can we that we use to to control the fractures. Um, so we're out walking down the out anywhere you are, and if you see something like this, you'll say, "Oh well, that's just an ordinary rock." Or you pick up this. Thing. Does that look like an ordinary rock? You're supposed to say yes. <laughs> ordinary rock. All right. So we're walking around. And we're looking at, and you're, well, that's just an ordinary rock. But if you, upon a close examination, if you break into it, you will see that it has uh, these fractures, these scars. Look, you see those scars? All right, that is characteristic of uh, the igne igneous material that can be uh, made into projectile points into tools. That is an important characteristic. So anywhere in the world that you go and you see this conchoidal fracture, that means that you'll be able to control the fracture, the, the breaks, unlike uh, this one. Right. So you look at this rock and you go, wow, that's just an ordinary rock, isn't it? Yes, it is. Right. <laughs> but, <I'm straight. laughs> Oh, and the good, very good. Nothing is ordinary because you go, wow, I better look at it, and boom. Uh, uh, so you're right. Everything has a, a place. So uh, an archaeologist friend of mine, when I, we were working, she walked over this. Actually, she, no, she walked over uh, one, something similar to this and said, uh, uh, Lizzie, you walked over an artifact. Oh, no, that's just a plain old rock. <laughs> so we picked it up and sure enough. Um, but actually, I made this one. Yeah, it took a little bit of time to make it. So this does not have a conchoidal fracture. This I can hit it in any direction, and I can control it this way. Yes, Ellen, question. How 
long did it take you to make that? You said it took a while. Um, I didn't keep track because it's just five minutes, ten minutes. Just keep working at it. Yes. Yeah, we'll keep quite a few hours. Yes. <laughs> when they X the back, uh, back side of it, where they turned it over, if it was uh, in real, uh, so they could find it, because um, some of the uh, Native Americans that did, or indigenous people that came from the Bay would go to the Knoll, and <coughs> under the barn and in all regional wilderness, we'd find the, the uh, Trunicated shells that they brought with them, and the brown squirrels would dig under the barn, and we find the shells from the forest. And I was told that the, the ones that they, you know, would be too heavy to carry back and forth. The mortars? Yeah, the mortars. Yeah. And yes. Hex the backside of them. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. This is, again, if I hit it, it's just going to shatter. Uh, so we have to learn that we're going to look for igneous rocks, that we can control the fracture, and that is uh, called the conchoidal fracture. Conchoidal fracture, um, it comes from the word concha, if anybody knows Spanish, conchoidal concha. Kind of look the scallop, <coughs> kind of the scallop shape right here. Um, we can use uh, chirps. Uh, there's a couple, the one popular on here is a couple of different chirps. One is a Franciscan chirp. So we can use chirps, uh, jaspers, uh, uh, chalcedonies. Some of these, unless you're a geologist, you know, we just call them jaspers or chirps because it's, it's not very easy. Here's a slate. You can actually hear that. You hear it? Um, actually, and then um, speaking of... Can the interview be conchoidal? Or yeah, yes, if you look closely. Yep. <coughs> Very good. And speaking of Iberian Peninsula, this is from my father-in-law. He brought this one from Portugal. And sure enough, evidence of some crushing right there. So we have the... Um, We have chert here along the, our coast. If you're lucky, we can find uh, some uh, knowledge of, of chert. And the main rock that I use is obsidian because to me, it's the softest, but it's not really soft. It's just the easiest to work. This chert, these cherts, jaspers, uh, some are even heat treated to help relax some of the, the, the crystals. Um, but we don't have to preheat obsidian. It's already microcrystalline. As it comes out of the volcano, it cools off super fast. Super, super fast is what creates this glass. So if the volcano can create it, can we humans create it? Yeah. So I can use a piece of glass. Um, to make a projectile point as well. Sure. Does uh, the chert come in a greenish color as well? Yes, it, it comes in different yeah. colors. That's what makes it. But it's got that glistness. Yes, right. and generally they all are, except for the slate somewhere. That little, the little key sound, that slate is right. It's not the smoothest of the others. I'm guessing the key feature of all of these is the edge. Uh, if it's an artifact, that is an artifact. I did not make that. Um, but the, yes, it, and I'll show you. What I, what I will do is I will back just in a second here. I'll walk over here and I'll show you how, those, how one is made. Yes, sir. Isn't there a salacious shirt here that's, that's inferior to the obsidian that they may have used? Yes, The old, we can find um, we can find inferior obsidian 
because as it cooled off, it started up um, crystallizing a little too soon, and it's slowly. So if you see air bubbles in the obsidian, you, you won't be able to control the, the uh, fractures as well. It's gonna be the same with uh, the uh, chert, which is sedimentary. I mean, all this was crushed. And so if it's not, uh, if it's not a good quality in any, in any rock, then you're not gonna be able to get uh, a good, good fracture and or control, control the work. This is the opposite. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, had, I think I read recently that the ammonia would trace shells for obsidian because it, is it just scarce here or does it, it's not made here? Or? No, correct. Okay. It's not local. Okay. The closest uh, is, um, but it's not very far away. Clear Lake? Yeah, Lake County. I haven't been there yet. Clear Lake? I, yes. I studied the Clear Lake. Yes. So, there is some upsetting up there. So there was traded. Um, different areas that, yes. And, and can't they trade, can they trade the trade route based on where the obsidian came from? Yes, and, we can. And where the, it, it's found. Yes, they can type, they can type the obsidian. And if you type this, this obsidian, my source is uh, Mount Shasta. Oh, wow. Mount Shasta. In the east side, so yes, we can definitely trade uh, and trace those routes. Let's uh, see if I can show you. And then, for those of you who may be late, you have a couple of sticks in your hand. Yeah. Uh, feel free to to experiment with them, because um, I might be asking you a question about it, and you may also want to share something about what you learned from those from those uh, sticks. Um, what we're doing with, this, with the plant is a ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is how our ancestors used uh, plants. Not the hard part. That's easy. How are we doing? in showing you how we can make a tool. We have a piece of obsidian. Question? Oh, no. I was just trying. <laughs> I have I've been playing with my sticks, like you said. Too. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. I'll be asking you. Oh, not bad. Um, again, piece of obsidian and a hammer, one of our tools is, is this, just a plain rock, but not really just a plain rock. It's a cool rock that's gonna, that I'm gonna use as a hammer. And I'm going to hit the obsidian. Now the important thing is not, not to hit the obsidian just anywhere. You have to hit it on one of the edges and the sides. And what's important is that the angles of some of the physics is that the angle has to be less than uh, 90 degrees. This one's less than 90 degrees. So anything that is 90 degrees or greater is not good to hit because um, of the, uh, the physics of the striking and the, the removal of, of the plate. For example, this one, If I hit it here on the edge, I will be able to, most of the time, uh, control the plate. And then it's right here. You see that? Oh. Can you see that, uh, Helen? Yes. It's better there. There, there, it's better. Yeah. yeah. All right. So there, I'm hitting it on the on this side, and boom. Oh, wow. oh. Right here. 
Let's do it again, boss. <laughs> lucky this time. <laughs> so hit it on the, one of the upper ends and then hopefully there's that fracture, the conchoidal fracture that comes off and, and then from there on we can identify where this flake was hit through the bulb of the percussion, ventral dorsal side and a lot of that as archaeologists we, we write down. So yes sir. So does the flake always happen on the opposite side of where you strike the we wanted to, <laughs> ideally, um, but as you will see, I don't do this often enough, but when I was living up in the cloud, I did spend hours and I would have a pile of obsidian. It gets addicting, it's really, it's just really nice to be able to strike it and no, 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 no. So, We'll see what I can do tonight. So have you been doing this since you were a child? Striking the city? <laughs> <laughs> no, not just up to No, I'm not to Um, I've cut myself several times. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And one of them one of the cuts was just talking to Griffin. And I Cut the top of my my finger, and uh, I didn't go to the doctor. So later on, I couldn't. I can't bend it very well. So I went to the doctor and said, "Hey, doctor, Doctor Hoffman, uh, can you look at my finger?" So he got the scalpel, and he cut over the top of it, and he put his hand in there. And go, oh, yeah, it looks like your tendon didn't heal very well, <laughs> and he just stitched it back. And did it work and it, then? No, no, no. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and so I, the doctor said, hey, what were you doing? I said, I cut myself with a piece of obsidian. Uh, what is that? Some new kind of steel? <laughs> no, doctor, it was in geology class. <laughs> so he had not heard about obsidian. But uh, some of you may have, because I'll show you as soon as I break this, break this, and I am, which one was 90 degrees? This one. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Hope it doesn't come to you. Oh, yeah. All right, gotta take a look at it. And then the mat's right there. They won't reach you. Okay. So, and I'll put my Right on the edge and see what happens. Oh, ooh, you hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh oh. Look at all this waste down here. Ah, not good. No, not good. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it's, it didn't change. All right. What do you want me to make out of this? What would you like? What kind of animal can we? You want to skin a? Well, this is big enough. We can skin a, a deer with. And so, to answer your question about the directionality, some of it is of these imperfections. I'm going to say. Uh, but, and then we can piece it back together. But, I'm sorry, your name? Annie? Yeah. Annie, I can make something out of this. But if I was going to try to show you how to make an arrowhead, then this is not good. <laughs> yeah, it's a little. Let me see if I can hit this somewhere. And. I immediately take the edges off. I'm gonna try it here. Ah! Not good. For an arrow. Yeah. Let me try this one. Ooh, that's pretty good. 
pretty close. Ooh. Ooh. Beautiful. Oh, that's good. That is really good. All right. So, you gonna bring me a dare, Annie? Um, um, I'm your uncle. You gonna bring me a dare? <laughs> bring me a dare anyway. John? John's cooperative. John, you got a dare? Um, I forgot to bring it with me. Uh, okay. So I don't want to kill anything. All right. Well, let's throw up some vegetables. Can you hold that? Good nice piece of potato. Yeah, okay, this is a potato. Now this is the edge. Got it. Super sharp. Wow. Um, if we look at this under a microscope, we'll see that it's microcrystalline. And if you compare this <coughs> to the scalpel, the scalpel is going to be like this because of the crystals in the metal. You look at this under a microscope, it's going to be, yeah, I can cut myself. It's going to be super smooth because of the, the super micro uh, crystals. Aren't they? So it's super smooth. They are making, uh, so Dr. Hoffman didn't know that they do make um, obsidian knives to do surgery in our eyes. And the reason is that it's so sharp, it pushes the cells apart. Whereas a scalpel or anything metal, it just rips the cells. And it takes the cells longer to uh, heal and, and to come together. I used to teach the Boy Scouts that it's better to cut yourself with a sharp knife than with a dull knife for that reason. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I actually didn't have much of a scar until Dr. Hoffman finished my <laughs> <laughs> So now you can see that. And then any of most cuts, yeah, you, can, you can't see them. So where is that piece? Right here. So, beautiful piece. Uh, I'm lucky. Maybe one more. There's where it came off. Yes, and I'll show you. Oh, okay. But it's easier for me. Out of this piece, I am going to make another knife. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Let's see. Hmm. Just thinking. Can you explain why it breaks off on the opposite side from where you're striking? Um, just uh, the shock waves and the physics of the angle. <coughs> Again, it's less than if I was to hit it here, it just does like a BB gun in a in a glass where it cones out, where it makes the cone. But in this case, the cone is here, so we actually do have a cone. But that right here, the bulb of percussion. If you shoot a BB gun in a window, you'll see the, the cone. But because of the, the degree, it's less than 90 degrees, you'll be able to push that, uh, the, the, the energy down into there. And it, you see where the energy stopped? Yeah. There, right there? That's where the energy stopped. Mm -hmm. So Bob, if you had hit it harder, would it have gone further? Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, yeah, but if I hit it harder at that same point, hopefully yes. But if I would have hit it further back, I would have probably got a bigger piece. And then, I, but you saw how these these were just all over the place. All right. So um, I wanted to show you the percussion plate. In one moment. 
two types of uh, of flaking, and then this is if you look up, uh, if you Google this, it's you Google wind mapping. Yeah. There's percussion flaking like this. If um, if I've used it quite a bit, if I'm going to uh, work on one of my tools in wood, or I'm uh, butchering a lot, then this is going to be dull. And so one of the ways to sharpen it is by uh, percussion plate. It's a percussion because I'm striking. So that's one way. And hear that? Yeah. Those are tiny, tiny flakes. The bigger flakes, uh, they're, very, they're identical flakes. The, s the same technology, the same. But these are smaller because these are smaller. And that's how I I make a, a knife or a spear point. Yes, Andy. Um, why do they use the arrow that's for the back of your hand? Am I going to use them? Like, are we going to use them to make the? Oh no, not this time. There's a bulb right here. Let me see if I can take that off. Right <laughs> Same principle. Yes. What do you is that a horn? Oh, I'm using? sorry. Oh. Thank you. It is. Actually, it's an antler. <laughs> Antlers fall off. Uh, horns do not. So this is a. Uh, this is a good size of deer. And my other tool, so I'm, sh I'm shifting from rocks to animals. And this is a elk. And you can see I've used it. So this is another one. It's a great tool as well. That I can get that. There's nothing there. Yeah, you should pay attention. So thank you for that. Um, that's percussion flaking, and I sh give a shape. I'm taking the edge off because that super sharp edge, I'm taking it off because I don't need it right now. I already uh, <coughs> used it for whatever I needed. And let's see that one. Let me see if I can make this look a little bit like a spear point or an arrowhead projectile point. Um, arrowheads, arrows were not actually. Um, in North America till about 2,000 years ago. There was a fluctu fluctuation between um, our, our peopling of America. So there's different dates at different areas, but generally uh, most archeologists, anthropologists will agree that the arrow, the arrow came about about 2,000 years ago in varying 500 years. And before that, spears? Spears and atlas where you throw, throw the spear. All right, I'm gonna sit right there. Oh. Right in front of me. Any questions? Yes, John. Uh, in areas where there were not volcanoes, did they have other ways of making arrowheads? Is it pretty much an igneous? Yes, as far as geology-wise. There was bone. There were bones, uh, plants, and you can probably make you know, some kind of crude implement from any, uh, even a piece of sandstone, perhaps, if you're in a pickle. The bear coming at you, grab something. 
Start sharpening real fast. Okay. Here, 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 my hand. This is, I need to protect my hand uh, with leather. So thank you, Annie, for that beer. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. And, oh, how's that? Different people uh, blend that different. I learned this way, so I put it in my, my thumb was up, up on top. The uh, piece of obsidian down at the bottom, and antler, and uh, well, I keep that, but I'm gonna take some of that off. Um, kind of obvious. I'm gonna sh see if I can make the point here. <coughs> and mm -hmm. same principle, right on the edge. Important. We were met, someone mentioned about, was that you, sir? You saw the ridge on the, one of those. It's important to, we, we create straight edges in, in a uh, ridge line by flip, uh, putting pressure on one end, and then we flip it and put pressure on the other end. That's what gives us the, that ridge and the sharp edge, to maintain the, the sharper edge. So there's a little bit of a bend there. Takes a lot of pressure. And I've got to make sure that I don't slip and cut. Still got a little bit. switch and now I have a straight edge. I'm going to come up from here. Ooh. And talking and doing this is not easy. So, if that bear was coming after us, this is the okay. And we're going to haft it, and you can put a notch it on the bottom. If you wish to put this on, on a stick. Learning is not that, learning this isn't very difficult, it's just the time consuming to practice. Harder, more durable than a 
regular bone for treatment? Did you use a bone? I do use a bone, but usually uh, I find that the antlers are easier. Isn't an antler more dense than where the bone could be hollow? Yes, yep, some, some of them. So that's, that's pressure flaking. Pressure flaking because we're, we're putting pressure all around, all, all sides. So there it is. So then how would you attach that? Okay, that's the next step. Yes, thank you. Next step, yes, question? Uh, no, we don't have time. But maybe some time we can. All right. So we've made we've made our, our projectile point, our arrowhead. Now we need a stick, correct? Any? Hmm. Which one? Which one of those could I use? Yes. No, Greg? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Did you? Uh, no, I don't think that's. Is that? Yeah, we're, we want to use the one that's willow. Yeah. Yeah. And did any of you end up tasting it? Ew! <laughs> oh, wait till I tell you something that's nice. Mm? I love the smell of this. Break it. Go ahead and break it. Smell it. Besides an IPA, <laughs> what uh, <laughs> might it? Thank you. Yes. Not good. One of the major uh, shafts all over the, uh, the United States, uh, North America, is willow. Willow is prevalent. Yeah. And you can find different species. There's hundreds of species of, of willow all over the world. And it, you can see that it, you can get it fairly straight. So all you have to do is look for a straight one. Okay, what are you thinking? IPA? Yeah. Okay. Salix. Salix? Mm. The genus? Aspirin. Aspirin. Yeah, salicylic acid yeah. is our aspirin. So if I get a headache, you just got to be careful with bleeding. But salicylic acid, well, it's a beautiful plant. Beautiful plant. Um, anything else we learned from that? What else did, did you, you do? Actually straight it? It seemed like it bent plastically. You could... Did you did you try bending yours? Did you yeah. break it? Well, you know, you can straighten it. Maybe you can take the bend off. Oh. Yeah, it's so good. Like this one? Yeah. So I can, huh? That one's so, green. Oh, it's green. Yeah. Yeah. But then, yeah. then they, they, they take a, didn't they take a piece of soapstone and run a groove? Wow, you know. And then hold it over the fire. Mm -hmm. Yes, so there, there's an easier way. Uh, it's already green. It's already green, so there's moisture in there. Um, so I told my, I was talking to my cousins, he said, uh, you know, I can straighten up almost anything. Um, and he brought me this. Okay, well, I dare you to strain this one out. I said, no problem. Right? Um, but yes, it's, it's um, naturally, it's, you can find some of the straighter ones, which will help you. But you are correct. On the rock side, one of the uh, beautiful uh, rocks from Mother Nature again is this um, and this. And you said you said what it was. So so. Like what? Oh, your acorn. All right. So so or, or steatite or talc. This is talc. Hmm. 
So, talc um, is used all over the world where we can find it, and it does excellent with heat. So I'm gonna heat this in the fire, and I'll put it uh, right there. And as I heat, as, I, as it's hot, I'm gonna run the shaft back and forth. Remember not to touch it for myself often. So back and forth, yeah. and it transfers the heat, and it reduces the moisture, it takes the moisture out, and then you can start uh, straining out. But, and I, this is, you're right, this is a little green. So even without heating it, it still has some moisture, so yeah. I can do that. <clears throat> and then I can put it back. Does that grow around here? This willow? Oh yes. You know uh, the end of Balboa? Yeah. Where it turns into dirt? That's where this is from. Yeah. Some of this is from there. Willow's will in riparian areas. Uh, it's all over. Yeah. Uh, so basically you're breaking the fibers inside the shaft when they're green. Breaking the, the fibers. Mm -hmm. the um, wow, that's silly. I think that goes into the cells, so I'm not sure. Because we're reducing the heat, so we're taking the heat out of the cells, the moisture. So I'm not sure about that. So willow is a, a beautiful one. Um, one, look at this, Annie. See, I feel that. What do you think was on there? Does it hurt? No. <laughs> kind of? But I don't, I think that's actually natural. Oh, it is natural. So this is a piece of wild rose. Oh. And if you look at roses, you think, no way, right? No way I'm going to be able to get a shaft, straight shaft out of it. But sure enough, you start looking around, and you will see some shoots out of uh, wild rose. Way harder. Than Way harder than willow, yes. Oh. To make a uh, make a notch on here takes a while. So wild rose is, is a excellent. A any kind of plant, and no matter where you're in the world, you see the shoots, the alder, sh alder shoots. Uh, might find some oak, then you can definitely use any of those shafts. Um, if you're out in the desert, um, greasewood. Mm. This is a tough one to find straight, but it's super yeah. strong as well. And this will hurt my hand trying to make it grow up. Um, so greasewood, wherever you are. Um, cane, some of the, if you get a chance. There's uh, compound arrows. Yes, because it looks very much like sugar cane. Cane um, is also used because of the compound arrow. We can make two. Uh, oh, I'll show you this in a moment. But we have cane. Uh, and uh, crazy. What about bush brush? Pardon? Bush brush is the uh, lead walk in the Central it, Valley. The see, I've noticed anything that, yeah, anything that has a straight, a good uh, uh, sap flower that you can use anywhere. So they would probably go in and cut the plant. Exactly. And get the shoot. Exactly. We. I go back, I go back to these sources uh, down in Tulare County, actually where this school was. Uh, yeah, we did, we did that, we do that. Go back, you burn, burn, and then keep track of where the shoots are, and you don't have to search like I do. Oh. Uh, very good, yes. Um, so we're going to attach the, the arrow the arrowhead, so I'm gonna use my tools. Whatever tool comes from there, I will get a tool. And everything that, that came from there, I utilize because there's nothing better to make this notch than obsidian. It's beautiful. It just works as a knife and it's excellent. Just gotta have some patience, kinda yeah. cool. Oh, yeah, you're right. I should have been using one of those, but this was handy. How about this one? Is this one okay? This one. All right, so I do this. All right. And I'm going to attach my arrowhead and I'm going to attach my arrowhead. 
here's the cool thing. You see this and this and this? All right. We use an animal part, which is this, from an animal. So muscle is meat. Sinew, tendon, exactly. Um, and the beauty about nature is nature gives us everything. Nature gives us anything we want. You want a cool string? Want a cool string? And then here it is. But, two things. And this is, do I need this? Does it need? Ellen, do I need this, this gizmo? So, what's that? Let's just take it off. It is the mic that's reverberating. Very um, cool material because it's super strong. None of us in this room can pull and just break that. There's no way. Right. Yes? What animal are the sinews from? The Generally, uh, the larger animals deer, elk, elk uh, from back here, right. and our tendon from back here, the leg, the heel. You know, if you cut that, you're not going to walk. Yeah, the cubic tendon. The tendon. Um, and it's dry and it'll be sitting in. Here's the cool part, Annie, is I'm gonna put this in my mouth and I'm gonna get it all gooey. <laughs> when was the last time you had a hamburger? <laughs> you eat meat? The stuff, the little, little things that get stuck in your teeth, you pull it on, it's shiny and silvery. But it's too small for you to use it. Here it is. I put the reactant with my saliva, and the tendon creates its own adhesive. Wow. This is just wow. one of the amazing things. It creates its own adhesive so that I do is wrap it. And wrap, wrap the sinew around the shaft, around the arrowhead, uh, the feathers, and I do not need any other glue. But if I go out hunting, if I go out hunting and I want to waterproof it, then I want to use what comes off the pine tree. Yeah. Yeah. Sap. Excellent. All these bubbles, all these bubbles, pop it and coat it if you're going to go out hunting. So do you coat the, just the feather part or also the... Uh, feather either part? one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can coat whatever you want to waterproof with pitch. Uh, also, we have tar. Oh, excuse me. What does that smell like? Yep. You didn't smell it. Another adhesive, if you want to water uh, waterproof, is is this cool one, which is asphaltum. And I don't know where to put asphaltum. What is, what is it called? Tar. Tar. Oil. So should I put it in the animal part? Uh, Dinosaurs? Yeah. Animal? Yeah. There you go. Uh, heat, heat the asphaltum and we can coat it and it'll waterproof. It also will make, if we want to make a knife, it also would coat this it also as a knife, a lot of and glue. Um, next is the are the feathers. Most any kind of feather that will work. Uh, primarily, our ancestors would uh, use use hawks. Some people do not like owls. They don't use owls. Um, primarily, hawk and eagle we can use. Uh, again, back to the tools. Uh, to split the feather. If you use a knife, the knife is too sharp and it'll, it'll push it to the side and, and crack the, um, and split the, the quill. So the, the obsidian lends itself beautifully to be able to split the feather down. Uh, 
Uh, so that's the string. We have tons of string. In your hand, do you have a, something to make string with? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? Yes. See the milkweed? I thought it smells like it. I jumped ahead and I should have said that. <laughs> milkweed, the stringy one, if you find out how to break it. The stringy one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's milkweed. Um, beautiful string. Uh, another string is this one. Uh, redwood. Redwood bark. The inside of the canyon layer. Get a nice green one. There's the, the, I made that string out of that. So fibers. And then I forgot, uh, Andy, you said this was, was this lumpy? Right? All right, so what would, what did I, uh, what do you have in your hand that I could use for this? Oh, try the horse tail. Here. No, that's an acorn. What looks like an acorn? That. Yeah. If you have a, you try it on your fingernail, you'll take it off, so be careful. Yes, that's sandpaper. Try it. Yep, that's our sandpaper. Horsetail is an excellent source, excellent source for sanding. And then this is the one my mom would say, hey, uh, son, bring me back some horsetail because uh, this is an uh, excellent uh, tea for urinary cleanup because of the, of the silica in it. So we would make teas out of horsetail. Whoa, 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 look at that. See, it works, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm just saying, you're doing it. It works really well. Sure, do it as long as you want. All right, strings. So we have strings for the feathers and waterproofing. Are the edges of the feathers cut again? I'm sorry? Are the outside edges of your feathers cut again? Here? Or is the length long? Is that the natural thing? No, they're trimmed this way? Yeah. Oh, they're trimmed. So willow, I'm sorry? You know, that, that is the only tool, modern tool, that I ever use on my arrows. I mean, I can make it complete, except for trimming. I don't, I don't know how to trim with a fitting yet. Compound arrow. These compound arrows. Um, this one is from my my people over in Mexico. So this has the cane and a follow right of it. Shaft. So there it is. It's a two part. So why do you do it in two parts? Well, this one is if you're going to shoot rabbits, you're going to shoot squirrels. You don't want to put a rock point because they're on the ground. Most likely they, you're going to miss, break, and you're going to break the point. So the, the uh, is you pull it out. Right. Pull it out, and I'll switch to this miniature model. That's from the Great Basin, but it also, it's almost works for California. This uh, is a model. So if I'm going to shoot a deer, I would use the obsidian point. Uh, a bird point. Do you remember people used to say you bird point? Uh, no, they were not. We don't use them for birds if they're made out of rock. Can you see that? And this is what I use for a bird. 
two sticks right there. And the thought of it is it's going to hit the bird and hopefully break its wing. And it increases the surface area by doing that. So cross stick. And then back to your rabbit is fine. So that's that's, that's the just sharp point. Right. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Oh, we usually burn it. And the heat uh, increases, the, it takes, removes the moisture, increases the, and causes some crystallization in the cells, makes it harder. Hmm. Wow. Anything else? Feathers sometimes are flat. It usually falls making a set for you when you're a boy. The feathers, two small feathers flat instead of three. It's quicker. It's a really pain, it's a pain tying, tying three together. It takes a while. Is it going? So was that was that a normal um, thing to be interchangeable with the arrow? Yes. I I never knew that. Compound. That's, that's interesting. So that was just a normal practice. <laughs> Mm -hmm. wow. Yep, so you can see it as far south as uh, uh, as far south as Mexico. Uh, Cecilia's dad, Cecilia's aunt once sent them a, a quiver from Africa, same thing, cane, uh, hardwood, and they even used files, the rectangular, rectangular file. Put notches on that. Oh. Bob? Yes, sir. Do you know how they organized the work? Did each hunter make their own arrows, or did they have people who made arrows back in the village and the hunters took them and went out and did their thing? That's a societal progression question. Um, generally, no. We begin with everyone doing it. And as we Increase in, in sedentary and jobs. <laughs> you do this, you do this, rather than let's communally do everything. Let's go, let's go get the deer, the rabbits, and then that starts to create some of that specialization. Is it known how much time it took a really accomplished arrow maker to make one arrow? Mm, no. I, I would. I would do it if I, when I do it, I do it in stages. I get the willow and I wrap it, throw it in the bed, and then I work on the projectile points when I'm tired and stop. Uh, no war coming, right? Right. So there's no hurry. I'll get to you next week. So no, I'm, uh, I'm not actually. I imagine too, like, for people who did this thousands of years ago, Yes, and there's some crummy looking projectile points. So there are probably people like me that maybe I'll try it. They work out too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. It's got to start somewhere. I think that's it. <laughs> Yucca. Another of my favorite plants. I have to bring it in. Beautiful fibers. Beautiful fibers. Uh, when I was working out in Las Vegas on some fires, I would sit on top of the ridge watch the lightning strikes, uh, get some yucca, and just made, um, made a six foot piece of string on, just from watching the lightning, listening to reggae. <laughs> <laughs> and talk and walk. This yucca is a beautiful plant, my favorite plant. I don't know which one my favorite plant. Maybe willow. It's, it's so diverse. Uh, somebody else can tell me something about the willow. Break it again. Uh oh, uh, basket making. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful. That roll of furniture. Willow furniture. Yeah. That roll of furniture. Something else about willow. Yeah. Oh no, I'm sorry. The little piece that you had. Oh. What can I do with it? Well, you can make it a switch and scare the children. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Split it. Yes, Annie. Hey, what did you find out? Break the teeth. Oh. Break, break that willow. Break. Okay. Um, well, I actually did try to, something like this, because you said that was cool. Um, I don't think that, you could, like, this thing, and wrap it next to the stick. That's how 
before he started his kids, you go, whoa, look at this stick. And then you start making it. So um, what, else, what else about Willow? Flexible. It's flexible. And when I talk to the kids, I try not to tell them. Because I, when I do this with kids, the students, I try not to say that this is what they can do. Look what it's doing. Making a rip. So I try not to tell them so much that they can come up with it themselves. So when we build the structure, I'll give them willow sticks, and I'll give them this, and hopefully cover your ears, give them really close. And then we, we use this to tie, um, to tie all the sticks together to make our, our shelter. And you, once you get fresh green willow, especially in the spring, you'll be able to. So I didn't give you very good sticks. My, yeah. That's my fault. Yes? I have one quick clarification question. Did you attach the arrowhead and the feathers to the shaft with the, the animal tendons or with the milking fibers? Animal tendons. Okay. It's the best. Okay. But if you're in a pickle, go ahead and use okay. the plant fiber. And yet we have the yucca fiber, we have the redwood, redwood fiber, milkweed fiber, all kinds of fibers. Once you start looking at, at the plant, you go, wow, there's fibers in it. Iris, iris plants, yeah. wild iris fibers. And I was chewing on a piece of asparagus. <laughs> and you didn't cut the bottom part. Very <laughs> Anywhere in the world we go. Yep. So transitions. Mother Nature will give you, will give you what you need. Glues, sticks, rocks. Bow. Elderberry. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Elderberry bow, common. Uh, and we, when you watch movies, don't believe them when they're doing this, right? They're not doing this. Well, our ancestors don't do it. Because, any idea why we don't shoot like this? No. no. Don't you get more uh, uh, a force with the type of wood that you're using to make the bow? Uh, you're close. And yep. You don't have to pull it back. It's you're hard. close. Um, these are simple bows. Pardon? Yes. Yeah. Hand eye coordination. Why? Because if you do this, you're going to have a tendency of pulling the hair, like European long bows and bow bows. It's because their bows are huge and just like a compound bow. These are simple bows. We do not pull back that far. Otherwise, we'll break. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the thing. If you want to even trade, if you want to trade, then I'll get rattlesnake skin, and I'll coat it with a rattlesnake skin, or I will use I will use a tendon and coat the back. This is modern name fiberglass. So, so coat the back, it's sinew back bow, you can look them up. Sinew back bow will give it the spring and you'll be able to pull back a little more. So for the the string, is that what did they use a tendon for the string? Yes. Okay. Tendons, fibers. Uh, probably using rawhide as well. Just get the rawhide from the belly, not from the side. So you had to get pretty close to your prey then, because you couldn't. Exactly. So that's why I've never shot anything. Because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to track it. I would have to tie the goat down. <laughs> uh, Dances with wolves that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Where they, they shoot Jenkins, Mullen, sure. the guy with the mules. You see how many shots they, how many arrows they put into them? Wow, yeah. this group? <laughs> what about the last thing on the weekend? 
the issues of the, the yeah. meal scanner. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So and that's true. Yeah. Because this arrow is not going to kill you. Like that. Yeah. And it's not going to drop a, a, a elk or a buffalo. You have to track it for days. So it gets very close, right? Uh, yes, close. And then that's one of the, the uh, hypotheses is when you shoot, this will stay. Yeah. This will come, go. This will drop, and then this will go. If the bear wants to break it apart, push on it, then it'll pull this off. This will go, continue bleeding, and then stay behind. Mm -hmm. All right. We know how to survive if anything happens now to make our jewels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> car, car go ahead, knock off a bear with one of these. Sure.